we'd like to first of all lay out why women feature on our first major conference of LSRI. First of all, the disproportionate impact of climate change and other environmental harms on the very poorest of the communities was something that was pointed out by Pope Francis at LSRI uh, uh, in, uh, in his encyclical, La Dato Si. But what wasn't really given maybe enough attention was that the majority of the poorest of the poor are women. And so women are also um, not only the sufferers of climate change and environmental harms disproportionately, they're also very often initiators of eco-social change at the grassroots and at other levels. So we hope those of you who um, join us today will sense that the solidarity that we want to share with women all over the world. And uh, what does this mean and how can our individual work enable that change to happen? There is, I believe, a wind of change in the church, which recognizes more than it did even a few years ago, the role of women in leadership. And we hope that this will, conference will at least uh, emblem, uh, provide an emblem for that, at least in a small way. We will to, to begin our um, conference today with case studies, um, grounded in, in work of women in particular, in different areas of the world, and then we'll also look at um, economic issues, so structural questions as well. And then the, the keynote address that we'll have at this afternoon on human rights is one of, by one of the most leading Catholic spokeswomen on issues of gender, Linda Hogan. So please stay tuned in to as much as, as you can today. And our conference as a whole, weaving between academic papers and panels that stress different areas of science, practice and policy issues reflect our own intention as an institute to model a different way of being a higher education work in a university setting. So we're genuinely interested in seeking an integration of knowledge so that these crucial issues at the boundaries can be addressed. And the, the focus uh, in this conference on women's solidarity and ecology is just the start of that process. So whatever brings you to our site today or in the future, we hope that the insights drawn from these sessions will enable you to start to think differently and act rightly to make the world, which is, of course, our common home, a much more equitable space for both the people and the creatures living in it. I'm going to hand over now to Becky Artinian Kaiser, who's our Associate Director at LSRI, for a few brief housekeeping remarks uh, who will then and she'll then hand over to the chair of our first session so thank you so much thank you celia and welcome everyone i just have a few quick housekeeping points the the first is that this conference is being held on zoom webinar so to participate in the dialogue please post your questions for the panelists using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If the session has a discussion section and not all of them do, the chair will then select questions to put to the panelists. The second point is that closed captioning has been enabled for the conference. So if you wish to turn on subtitles, please click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. And finally, most sessions of the conference are being recorded and will be made available to participants following the conference. Thank you very much. And we're delighted to have you here with us. I'll hand over now to Dr. Severin Danula, the Director of International Development at the Laudato Si Research Institute, who will introduce the opening case studies panel. Thank you very much, Becky. And welcome to this opening panel entitled Solidarity with the Earth, which gathers case studies from Latin America, Africa, and Asia. We have chosen to open this conference with case studies with the aim of anchoring our discussion in the next few days in the concrete reality of people's lives and the life of our ecosystems. As Pope Francis reminded us in Fratelli Tutti, Solidarity finds concrete expression in service, which can take a variety of forms in an effort to care for others. And service in great part means caring for vulnerability for the vulnerable members of our families, our society, our people. 
Service always looks to their faces, touches their flesh, senses their closeness, and even in some case suffers that closeness and tries to help them. Service is never ideological, for we do not serve ideas, we serve people. And this is why we wanted to start our discussion on women's solidarity and ecology, to see, to listen, to feel what is happen happening to our earth. And we are delighted to have three panelists who have a long experience of working closely with communities at the forefront of ecological struggles around the three continents. We start with Mauricio Lopez, who will share with us his reflections on commitment born from a life-giving womb in Amazonia. Mauricio, as Executive Secretary of the Ecclesial Conference for the Amazon, which is working to implement the proposals of the 2019 Amazon Synod. And he's also the promoter of the Ecclesial Networks Alliance for Integral Ecology at the Laudato Si Research Institute. We will then move to Africa with Muchimba Sia Machoka, who will talk of her experiences of courage and solidarity in reclaiming our common home in the context of Zambia's forests. Mushimba is a program officer for the Social and Economic Development Program at the Jesuit Center for Theological Reflection in Zambia. And she is involved in working for an improved political and economic governance that is responsive to the needs of the poor and marginalized. And we conclude this panel further east with Sharon Bong, who, who will be presenting a feminist post-colonial reading of the Save Malaysia Stop Blinas protest around a rare earth processing plant in Malaysia. Sharon is Associate Professor of Gender Studies at the School of Arts and Social Sciences at Monash University in Malaysia. She's a forum writer for the Catholic Theological Ethics in the World Church and editorial board member of Concilium. But let's turn the globe of a little blue planet back to Latin America um, with Mauricio Lopez, who will share his insights on the Amazon um, and this life-giving room of humanity. So Mauricio, over to you and you have 15 minutes. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Good morning to everyone. I'm just going to share my screen with a few images that might help us along the way. I am very grateful for the invitation and hoping that I can be faithful to the so many voices of women around the Amazon and the Catholic Church mission there. Without them, this mission would not be possible at all. One of the most important elements for the Catholic Church and for society as a whole today as a truly transformative vision is what the encyclical Laudato Si offers us as a category for a new reading of reality by this interpret ecology. Although it seems that these are the dimensions that integrate it represent paths already journeyed, it is the conjunction of all of them what opens new paths for our planetary society. There is a true dialogue between the social, political, environmental, cultural, economic, and even the spiritual dimensions. This can only be accomplished to an epistemological rupture, which needs to happen now, and will probably come from the peripheries of most of the more radical and profound changes around our society. And there, the role of women is indispensable. In the Amazonian territoriality, especially from the cosmic vision of the native peoples, this vision of interconnection and, and belonging to the whole has always been present in their identity and practices. However, Western societies and the Catholic Church have often considered those as irrelevant, subject to colonization, in order to impose a supposed single truth and establish progress, always from an external dominant vision. That is why we need to humbly pay attention to what they have to offer. This is no longer a philanthropic stand, but it responds response to the very urgence to embrace other cosmovisions, which might purify our Eurocentered and northern centered cultural plus. In the face of the greatest socio-ecological planetary crisis, 
it is necessary to abandon the failed paths and recognize in other traditions, such as those of the indigenous peoples and their ancestral wisdoms, possible new paths for the integral liberation of our world. But we need to start with our own steps, metanoia, a radical change of the, of the heart. For this, it is, it is necessary to reaffirm the role of women in the epistemological rupture that is required today to heal this broken planet. Too many women, both in the church and in society, are victims of structural injustice and exclusion that seem to have no end. In the church, we have a historical debt which cannot be overlooked to reaffirm the irreplaceable role in the building of the kingdom. We constantly talk about this, but very little is done to change this. There is a major challenge today. I'm going to quote the final document of the Amazon Synod, which says, to work together, the church requires a synodal conversion, synodality of the people of God under the guidance of the spirit in the Amazon. With this horizon of communion and participation, we seek new paths, religious life, the lazy and special women are the always and ever new protagonists who call us into this conversion. In the geographical and existential periphery of the Amazon, as a territorial experience that the Pope himself wanted to bring into the center of the church and to the society to illuminate its transformation, there will be no myth and whatsoever without women. In this territory, in the Amazon, they represent 70% of the missionary presence to the people of God who cry out for justice, for relevant pastoral accompaniment, and for a significant presence with the little ones, the blessed. Most of the times, women are the ones providing that response. However, women only have 30% of the leadership positions in the Amazon region. The Amazon Synod affirmed that without their presence, there is no future for the church. Another quote from Pope Francis in his meeting with the Brazilian uh, bishops in Rio de Janeiro, 2013. Let us not reduce the involvement of women in the church, but instead promote their active role in the ecclesial community. If the church in her complete and real dimension loses women, she re risks becoming sterile. The local church in the Amazon, as elsewhere, is guaranteed by small missionary church communities close to the people's life. Especially women are there, day in and day out. The Second Vatican Council expressed in 1966, the hour is coming, in fact has come, when the vocation of women is being achieved in its fullness. The hour in which woman acquires in the world an influence an effect and a power never reached until now, 1966, and see how much we failed to advance in this process. In this reflection to the faithful in, in this process, I wish to take some of the conclusions of the thematic forum and women in the Amazon preparing for the Amazon Synod, in which we had the participation of more than 50 women from six Amazon countries, including Maurice, eight people. Yes. Mauricio, sorry to interrupt you, but your, your mic is um is not is gives an echo. Can you hold it next to your mouth? Because okay. the sound let me see if this works better. E uh, let me see. Uh, should be working directly from the computer. Is this better? Slightly better, yes. Sorry about that. Okay. No problem. So I'm going to take uh, some elements from a reflection of uh, about 50 women from six Amazon countries, including eight indigenous nationalities and afro descendant representatives, which were part of the preparation towards the Senate. Certainly one of the most significant reflections, which influenced the whole process and the official documents and the outcomes of the Senate. We have a number of assemblies, territorial assemblies, thematic forums, but this one was especially inspiring and continues to be so in our mission. So the major challenges faced by women in the Amazon, these are not women's problems. They are problems that affect women. Society insists 
that we take care of our own problems, but in reality, they are everyone's problems and they affect us all. The major problems that they found in the Amazon were, were physical, psychological, sexual, reproductive, and territorial violence. Invisibilization of the role and empowerment of women. Lack of knowledge about the role of women in the public sphere. It is believed that the role of women is only in the domestic sphere. Violation of women's rights in general. Loss of culture, traditions, memory, family lineage, because there are other things that attract us. We distance ourselves from cultural knowledge. It hurt women to have a church that not always welcomed the problems in an interior way of women, nor of the territory or their culture. The role of women has been cataloged as inferior just for the fact of being women, condemned only to obey. They are marginalized. In the religious field, women's rights and duties are restricted. They are the reader, the cleaner, the one who collects and carries, and in important ceremonies, women are not allowed to interpret the word of God. Inequality in education, health, and social family spheres. Next element is the contribution, the particular contribution of women to the Amazon societies and in general. Resistance, resilience, hope, diversity, feeling, and organiza organization. Resilience in the face of violence in general, and how we have created situations to exist and survive, even in the midst of uh, violence. Construction of diverse spaces, spaces of struggle and resistance, sustaining hope, life, and strength of women. Recognition of human pain and the pain of the territory in the midst of the, those who believe, discover Jesus, and become witness of love and justice. And in the face of internal and, and external violence, we offer strength and organization. Again, these are the voices of the people in the territory, in all of the diversity, trying to offer some perspectives for the whole church as they have been doing for many years and they continue to do. Some of the challenges to make social action visible. Church and society should recognize the social, political, initial and social role of women. Inter intercultural dialogue on gender equality. The Western view of gender equality does not include the understanding of Amazonian indigenous women. There is a very Western view from the state, church, and society on gender equality, not considering fully the diversity of the Amazonian peoples, their ancestral knowledge, history, experience, and sexuality. A very hierarchical church. We want to show the face of the church as women. We need to reconfigure the face of the hierarchical church showing a face from the femininity as people of God in this church. Not to create a spaces from the masculine and structural perspective, but from an identity of women, people of God. And finally, some horizons for the conversions which we need so very much. There is a need for a church which is sister and apprentice no longer a mother and teacher, an inclusive church, deconstructed to learn from the Amazonian cultures, especially the indigenous peoples, a church that helps maintain the living roots of the cultures through integral formation, intercultural dialogue, and embracing spirituality and traditions, supportive, supportive of the diaconate of women and of the ministries for the Amazonian peoples and the Amazonian women. The sacraments are the celebration of life, and these expressions of celebrating life exist in different peoples, cultures, and, and spiritualities. From the indigenous spirituality, the sacraments are in Mother Earth, the rivers, waterfalls, etc. We need an Amazonian theology that also has a woman's face. To be truly an Amazonian church, it must be open to the knowledge and understanding of the spirituality of the peoples and continue to foster dialogue between faith and culture. 
final reflection following this inspiring, challenging, and countercultural, and yet present for so many decades, voice of women, which I bring to you, not my voice, but their voice coming from this process of listening in the preparation of the Amazon Synod. It is crucial to embrace, foster, and respect the indispensable presence of women that sustain and have been doing so for many years, the mission of the church in the Amazon region. This is the only way in which we will overcome the male-centered, clerical, and hierarchical, outdated way of major parts of the Catholic Church. It is time for change and interior ecology as an approach should be embraced by transformative presences of liberated women and men. And this might help us create new bridges towards the healing future in solidarity with one another and with a life giving gate. This is the final quote from Tilha de Chardin to finish my sharing. Only love can bring individual beings to their perfect completion. As individuals, by uniting, uniting them one with another, because only love takes possession of them and unites them by what lies deep, deepest within them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mauricio, for this deep account of of women in the Amazon and the sign of, of hope as well for, for the church. Uh, as you say, to go from a mother and teacher to a church that learns and that fosters intercultural dialogue. And so we move from Amazonia to, to Zambia. Um, Mushimba, if you can share your screen. Not a problem. Um, hello, everyone, and um, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to share and learn uh, from one another in such an important conversation. As earlier introduced, my name is Muchimba from Zambia, Lusaka to be specific, and I will be sharing today on courage and solidarity, a moral imperative to reclaiming our common home. My presentation will just take a simple outline where I will give an introduction, speak to solidarity and courage for a just world, share a snapshot of the human phase of climate change in Zambia and share some reflections beyond that. A growing challenge for the world today and one that is really eminent across the entire world is the fact that our common home is being threatened. A lot of livelihood activities such as pollution and deforestation have continued to have an impact on the environment, our only common home. Unfortunately, uh, a crisis such as climate change is one that is not gender sensitive and is one that does not even take cognizance of the status of a particular person. And in such instances, you tend to know that the most vulnerable in society, people that cannot fend for themselves, people that cannot defend themselves, tend to be disadvantaged. And really one emphasis that every human being should be able to enjoy is living a life that is full of dignity. In speaking to solidarity and courage for a just world, solidarity in its simplest form is just looking at being in harmony, being in harmony being in unity, moving in one accord, and this list is endless. However, to actually stand up for a just world, this requires that one has courage. Courage to speak up, even for the voiceless. Courage to take action, no matter how small. I do think of courage at an individual level as an element of where we look at fostering any collaborative effort. And this is regardless of what implications that would have for you, for as long as one is standing upon that which is right. Collaborative efforts remain paramount in ensuring that everybody, whether young or old, is proactive about caring for the environment as the effects, the devastating effects of the environmental damages tend to cut across um, different facets of human life. As we reflect on the encyclical letter, the Laudato Si of the Holy Father, Pope Francis, on the care for a common home, 
we are reminded that a common home is like a sister with one whom we share our life with, with one who we treat well and rewards us in that sense. We see a picture here of a little girl enjoying the fruits um, of the land. And this is because we have tended and we have cared for the environment. In moving on, we note that our sister now cries out to us because of the harm that has been inflicted on her by our responsible use and abuse of the goods with which God has endowed us. This just reminds us really, as we look and reflect on this next slide, that the entire material universe speaks of God's love and his boundless affection for us. God has given us this earth to enjoy and live in, and it is therefore our responsibility, and we are meant to dig deep within to actually stand up and be just to Mother Earth. Moving on to the human face of climate change here in Zambia, it is important to note that in the climate change discourse or any environmental discourse, human beings tend to influence um, the earth in different ways. This is through the livelihood that we have undertaken. For instance, the burning of fossil fuels, the cutting down of forest trees, the farming of livestock. This tends to add to the enormous amounts of greenhouse gases that are naturally occurring in the atmosphere. And in that sense, we tend to see the greenhouse effect and challenges such as that of global warming. Zambia is a landlocked country in the sub-Saharan African continent with an estimated population of over 17 million people. Despite enjoying a stable and peaceful democratic multi-party system, the country has been faced with a number of challenges. And this is just to contextualize the conversation around the climate discourse here in Zambia. Some of the challenges that we have been faced with as a country do include high levels of poverty, something that is not um, unique to Zambia only, but the vast African continent where we have over 55% of the population living in extreme poverty. Other issues such as food insecurity, where we have over 70% of the population being food insecure, insufficient economic diversification, insufficient initiatives and savings and investments, as well as diseases, including the global pandemic that the world is facing, such as the COVID-19 pandemic. most pressing issues has had an effect on social economic development. The country is already experiencing climate induced hazards. These include drought and dry spells, seasonal and flash floods have been seen. To contextualize this even further and to place a spotlight on my country, here we have a picture that is showing the deforestation activities that are taking place. Trees are being cut down for many reasons, but one common practice as you will see with the photo on the right hand side is a livelihood. And this is using charcoal as a source of energy. This is one thing that is quite common because we do have a challenge of electrification where a number of rural areas do not have access to electricity. So they tend to rely on charcoal to, as used for cooking, charcoal as used for keeping warm, especially in the cold seasons. So Zambia has one of the highest deforestation rates in the world, losing between 180,000 and 250,000 hectares each year of um, our forests. And while this is harmful to the environment, as mentioned earlier, charcoal production has remained a livelihood and is a highly demanded source of energy for different households. What I would like to place emphasis on is that this crisis bears two faces. On one end, on one hand, there is a need to adopt alternative technologies and fuels that are currently hindered by poor enabling conditions. On the other side, inequality in the form of poverty and vulnerability at risk of remaining high for as long as we do not provide people that are dependent on a livelihood such as charcoal producing um, ventures to support their livelihood. This is really a grave challenge and it does not have um, a one size fix or approach because as we move to take care of our forests, to replant trees, to foster any actions, 
towards um, improving our environment. We also need to provide an alternative for the different marginalized societies that would rely on charcoal selling, for example, as a means of actually putting food on their table. So really, Zambia is part of the integrated global system and we are all facing a common threat. And therefore we cannot ignore this um, climate change and its impacts. However, to be very deliberate, inclusive transformation will require that deliberate policies are provided and they are able to provide valuable empowerment to women. You will tend to note that women tend to make up a larger portion of our informal sector. Therefore, when they are robbed of their livelihoods, we all know the implication that this has on young children. And just to emphasize, and this is one call that we have made as civil society to our governments, while we are speaking of climate change having affected our economy in different entities, we do have opportunities in which we can make a change. And one of these opportunities has been through our national budget allocations towards the environmental protection. We cannot talk about climate change and not be consistent in terms of the resources that we are channeling to combat the crisis. And even as the world looks at uh, the COP26 and any other global initiatives that are taking place, it really takes courage for one to stand upon what is right in terms of resource allocation and seeing that commitment all the way until the end. And even as I move on to include, really in retrospect, we need to note that in today's society, the most excluded remain the poor, the vulnerable, street kids, victims of war, people with disabilities that are sometimes still stigmatized. It is our duty to remain committed to working with the poor by being bold and speaking without fear or favor, especially where social injustice tends to be um, the order of the day. Through collaborative efforts, collaborative, this is regardless of which continent one, way, one may be in, the fight against inequality is one that can be championed through advocacy, through platforms such as this, just to engage with different governments across the world on the need for prudent financial management, on the need for prudent resource allocation to combating the climate crisis. And as noted earlier, even as we approach the UN COP26 climate talks this year, we do hope that world leaders will come together to agree on working towards ending the climate crisis where every player is given an opportunity at the table. And in saying so, many developed countries would not to say that the developed world has already gotten there, but we are trying to bridge the gap and the only way that we can do so is through industrialization. But then we continue to create or endanger our economy. So therefore that is why each and every political player, each and every actor really needs to come on board and this ensures that we are committed. And beyond this, transparency of responsibility will remain an enemy of good stewardship in whatever work we are doing. This is not the time to point fingers, but to take an action, no matter how small it may be in your daily initiative, really be bold enough, be courageous enough to make a difference. And even as I end um, on this last slide, I know I still have some time. I would really like to leave us all with this reflection. And this is just from this. The earth is our environment to protect and the garden to tend. The earth is our environment to protect and the garden to tend. We are in a decade of action, even as we look towards the sustainable development goal. This is really a time for leadership. This is a time for decisions to be made. However, the lack of universal solidarity with one another and Mother Earth will continue to remain a cause and consequence of the ecological degradation in many forms. No nation can combat this challenge on its own. No nation can face this crisis on its own. If one thing COVID has taught us this year is really that the global world that we live in is much more connected than we thought. Therefore, we must all become more willing to act. And remember, courage is one thing that can drive us through. Let us have a conscience that will demand action regardless of how small. 
demonstrating the moral imperative that lies within each and every one of us is what we would actually do much better in this decisive decade to create a new and better home for us all. If I would be allowed, I would like to end my presentation here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Muchimba, for these um, stories from Zambia about you know, the tension sometimes between livelihoods and care for the earth, but also you know, the need for, for collaboration and courage. As you said, you know, there's no time to point the finger, the, the finger, but to act and to act with courage in whatever, whatever we can do. So thank you, Muchimba. We move now to, to Malaysia, where Sharon will also share stories of courage in the face of ecological devastation. Sharon, over to you. You have yeah, 10, 15 minutes. Okay, hopefully 15. <laughs> Thank you, Severin. Hello everyone and good day. Allow me to share my slides. Thank you very much, Celia, for this opportunity to present at this very exciting conference on women's solidarity and ecology and Severin for the introduction and for chairing the session. I address you all today as a specialist in gender and religious studies and a feminist Catholic from Malaysia. And this is the title of my presentation, Rare Earth and Rare Practice of Integral Ecology, a feminist post-colonial reading of Save Malaysia, Stop Lina's Protests. I begin by providing a background of what rare earth elements are, its uses, mining and processing rare, rare earths in Malaysia through a focus on two plants, a spotlight on grassroots activism by Malaysians and their allies. I move on to a feminist reading of these protests through interrogating the trope of the womb. The trope of the womb causes through these processes and narratives that fleshes out the violence of rare earth extraction and colonization of the earth and its resources. The final part of the presentation offers a post-colonial reading of these people-centered narratives of dissent that are pit against profit-oriented narratives within the North-South divide. With reference to the image on the left, the periodic table, you can see the 17 rare earth elements, chemically similar metallic elements that comprise yttrium, scandium, and the 15 lanthanide elements. Rare in rare earth elements may signify its value, but not its scarcity, as they are not particularly rare. There are many identified sources of rare earths globally. The largest producer is China, followed by the US, Russia, Thailand, etc. The rare earth elements are essential as catalysts in the automotive and the petrochemical industry and as vital elements used in flat panel displays of smart TVs and smartphones and high performance permanent magnets used in wind turbines. In short, rare earth elements are vital for fancy gadgets and green technology. The problem with rare earth elements lies not in its amount or supply but rather the radioactivity associated with them. It's a cause of concern whenever Malaysia earns the accolade of largest as a Malay Muslim majority nation state with a population of 32 million today. And this holds true with regard to the Japanese owned Asian rare earth plant and the Australian owned Lina's advanced materials plant. The map shows the location of these plants in West or Peninsula Malaysia. The older Asian rare earth plant is a mining plant to extract yttrium from monazite, and the new Alinas plant is a processing plant for rare earth elements mined 4,000 kilometers away in Mount Weld, Australia. The sad history of the Bukit Merah new villages also lies in the exhausting anti-rare earth campaign, which exposes a tragedy of betrayal of leadership about people in power losing their moral compass to the pool of profit. First protest that started in 1982, culminated 10 years later 
with the villagers suing the Asian rare earth plant and winning. The High Court injunction ordering the shutdown of the plant within 14 days was shortly overruled by the Supreme Court. However, the image conscious Mitsubishi chemical due to pressure from within Japan and internationally reached an out of court settlement with the affected communities. But they denied any responsibility for the diseases in the villages. For instance, miscarriages, birth defects and leukemia. Remembering the trauma of the Asian rare earth plant and its human and ecological impact is what drives the anti leaders protesters who have been campaigning since 2011. In 2019, the then government reneged on its electoral promise and renewed Lina's corporation's operating license for another six months. One of the highlights of the anti Lina's activism across numerous public demonstrations includes the 300 kilometer Green March on foot, comprising 20,000 protesters, which ended in a standoff with the police. Other countless acts of civil disobedience, petitions, hunger strikes, and demonstrations resulted in activists being pelted with tear gas and detained under the Draconian Internal Security Act. A feminist reading of these protests is firstly, to foreground the gendered impact of this fracture or wound, where the earth readily yields rare earth elements, processing it from other minerals involves the use of strong chemicals, which are non-natural elements. The extraction of rare earth elements, therefore, generates hazardous waste defined as ignitable, corrosive, reactive, or toxic, such as radioactive thorium and uranium, and their radioactive decay products, such as radium and radon. Radioactive waste containing water is also produced, as well as non-radioactive waste. The Linus plant, for instance, produces 500 tons of liquid discharge into the nearby Balok River that flows into the South China Sea. This would not only damage the ecosystem, but also adversely impact the fishing and beach tourist industries of the local communities, already burdened with health risks and illnesses. This constitutes a violation of the womb of the earth. Dumping radioactive waste in abandoned mines is akin to killing a rape victim. Instead of healing the piece of land, we are destroying it forever, a quote by a leading anti Lina's protester. An inference may be made to the Asian rare earth plant cleanup, one of Asia's largest operations. In addition to the irreversible environmental trauma, the womb of the earth is further violated as 11,000 truckloads of radioactively contaminated material is entombed 25 feet inside the core of a pristine hill range. This permanent disposable facility is not unlike a cancerous tumor infecting the womb of the earth, especially if the integrity of the structure that is container cells is compromised. A feminist reading of these protests is secondly at risk of essentialism to show the parallelism between the womb of the earth and women's wombs. The specter of decay and death is manifest in the wombs of women like Madame Kwan shown here, resulting in severe birth defects of her son, Kok Leong, who suffered lifelong severe disability. The disproportionate burden of care endured by Madame Kwan in relation to her utterly dependent son is extended to her daughter who is deprived of basic education as she had to leave school to take care of the family. Their plight reflects the hardships of women who are doubly marginalized on account of their sex and class. Gendered inequalities and inequities are further compounded by their having to manage the environmental fallout. That is, contamination to water systems affecting their food security, health hazards affecting their job security, and overall reproductive health and rights. 
There is a need to recognize the critical intersection of climate justice and gender justice in terms of differentiated needs, vulnerabilities, and capacities among women, between women and men, where these differences are further inflected by class, caste, and ethnicity, nationalism, and creed. This intersection is disappointingly absent from Laudato Si. Although largely gender blind, Laudato Si, the spirit of liberation theologies, spotlights the class distinction and lopsided power dynamics between the North and South. A post-colonial theologizing of the binary of North-South calls to question such systemic colonization of the global South by, by the global North in particular, an intergenerational ecological debt that is born potentially in perpetuity by the South. Pope Francis fittingly derides this as structurally perverse. The structural violence has sustained such ethics of international relations and resonates with binaries of colonizer, colonized, first world, third world, master, native other, and home, and offshore dump sites. This is firstly shown by the complicity of the Malaysian government in putting profits before people, and secondly, global society at large through the insatiable demand for fancy gadgets and green technology. To alleviate such oppression of poorer, thus more vulnerable communities and countries, the practice of differentiated responsibilities serves only as a band aid the Pope calls on developed countries to help pay this ecological debt by significantly limiting their consumption of non-renewable energy and by assisting poorer countries to support policies and programs of sustainable development. This call is out of touch with the questionable ethics and hidden environmental costs of green technology. Clean up industries are more profitable than clean industries, even in the short term. The Pope notes that the poorest areas and countries are less capable of adopting new models for reducing environmental impact. This is precisely what richer countries are exploiting, which adds to the reduced costs of fancy gadgets and the offshore processing of rare earth elements that adds to the illusory green greenness of green technology at home. The globalization of indifference is the element that fuels the wounding of the South by the North with regard to rare earth element mining and extraction. A post-colonial reading of protests also extends to Malaysians and their allies living abroad, who staged a three-day Occupy event at Lena's Corporation's headquarters in Sydney, Australia. The Occupy Lena's Act of Resistance is reminiscent of the global Occupy movements in 2011, such as Occupy Wall Street and Arab Spring. The grassroots movement of protests that begin with local communities directly affected swell up as Malaysians stand in solidarity with them. The support that ripples outward include international relations and both Malaysians and allies living abroad. Consonant with the Occupy movements, is the foregrounding of the 99% or the multitudes. Riga and Kwok, sorry, the uh, multitudes in this context range from the afflicted, such as Madame Kwan and her offspring, who courageously spoke out. Activists who through countless acts of civil disobedience manifest a rare mobilization of people power to defeat state-backed transnational corporate power. A theology of the multitude, according to Jörg Rieger and Kwok Prilan in Occupy Religion, speaks of continuing reflection and praxis where hope is embodied in such protests. Such hope potentially transforms the, earth, the hearts and minds of not only the Malaysian citizenry, but also the world in upholding the humanity of the 99%, the differently abled, downtrodden, and disenfranchised. To conclude, a feminist post-colonial eco-theology insists on the prioritization of the intersectionality between climate justice and gender justice. This sadly continues to be elusive for the Malaysian people in the inexhaustible fight against the structural violence of dirty industries 
and state complicity, hope that is embedded in the post-colonial theology of the multitude coheres with the practice of integral ecology that has sustained these protests through the decades. Theirs is a praxis, to quote Pope Francis, made up of simple daily gestures, saying no, standing up and crying out, which break with the logic of violence, exploitation and selfishness. In the end, the world of exacerbated consumption is at the same time a world which mistreats life in all its forms. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Sharon, for this account of structural inequality and, and also at the level of, of, of women um, and, and, and finishing with hope uh, embodied in these, these protests. Unfortunately, we have no, no time for, for questions and reactions, but I invite you to, to keep these, these stories from these three continents at the back of our, of our mind um, when, when we continue the, this, this conference to, to kind of anchor the, the theological arguments in these concrete realities. So we'll have um, what, eight minutes for a break and we'll start promptly at, at one o'clock for the ecological economics panel. So see you in, um, in a few minutes. <laughs>